the fields of Normandy, France. For centuries, the church bells here have rung to call the faithful to worship. But in the summer of 1944, they ring to signal the beginning of liberation. This is Ranville War Cemetery in Normandy. By June 1944, the Allies were ready for the invasion of France, and the first Canadian liberators on French soil belonged to the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. This is the grave of Private Mort Ellefson. He was killed in action at Normandy, 6th of June 1944, age 22. His inscription reads, Sleep on, dear son, take thy rest. God called you home, he knew best, mom and dad. Private Ellefson was one of 5,000 Canadians to die in the Battle of Normandy for king and country. the coast of France. The Nazi armies that for four years have ruled supreme in Europe look out from their fortified bunkers, knowing that an Allied invasion is coming. But they don't know where or when. Across the Channel, 150 kilometers away in England, the Allies are finally ready for the great gamble a seaborne invasion of Normandy. 156,000 Allied troops board planes and ships. Amongst them are 14,000 Canadians, all volunteers, men from all walks of life. Like the three Westlake brothers from Toronto, Tom, Albert, and George. Now they're all soldiers. Dear Mary and Johnny, I will start with telling you that Tommy, Albert, and I are in the best of health. I've seen Albert when I went on leave and spent a couple of days in London with him. We had a good time, but what a lady killer he is. The same old Westlake. Well, it won't be long to the second front, and then home, good home. I must be along now, Mary, but send my love to all at home, and please do not worry if you hear some bad news. I will be all right. I promised a certain person I will be back. Your loving brother-in-law, George. June 6th, 1944. Hundreds of landing craft silently approach the French coast. But before the fate of Europe is decided, 100,000 men will die on the battlefields of Normandy. Dawn. June 6, 1944. The Allied bombardment opens up. The Allied plan. Land on the beaches, break through the German coastal fortifications, and push inland. The Canadian objective, codenamed Juno Beach, lies between courcelles sur mer and Saint-Aubin. In a landing craft heading for shore is Company Sergeant Major Charlie Martin of the Queen's Own Rifles. As we moved further from the mothership and closer to the shore, it came as a shock to realize that the assault fleet just behind us had disappeared from view. Suddenly, 
There was just us and an awful lot of ocean. We had never felt so alone in our lives. Bernier-sur-Mer became visible. It could have been a picture postcard of any one of a hundred tiny French beaches with a village behind. Now, as we came closer, it was a strange silence that gripped us. This is Juneau Beach, Canada's responsibility on D-Day. The Canadian sector extended from Courcelles in the west to St. Aubin in the east. This small section of the beach here was known as Nan White, and it was the responsibility of the Queen's Own. At around 8 a.m. on June 6, 1944, the gates of the landing craft opened and the infantry stormed ashore. The question was, would all the planning and preparation pay off? The moment the ramp came down, heavy machine gun fire broke out from somewhere behind the seawall. The men rose. I said, move fast. Don't stop for anything. Go, go, go. We raced down the ramp, Jack and I side by side, the men closely following. We fanned out as fast as we could, heading for that seawall. The machine gun fire and mortars never let up. A barrage of shelling that seemed to come from everywhere. As we raced across the beach, we had no time to think. Our training did our thinking for us. Facing a storm of fire further down the beach, near the village of Saint Aubin, is the North Shore Regiment and its chaplain, Father R. M. Hickey. The beach was sprayed from all angles by enemy machine guns, and now their mortars and heavy guns began hitting us. Crawling along in the sand, I just reached a group of three badly wounded men when a shell landed among us, killing the others outright. As we crawled, we could hear the bullets and shrapnel cutting into the sand around us. When a shell came screaming over, you dug into the sand and held your breath, waited for the blast, and the shower of stones and debris that followed. Then, when it cleared a little, right next to you, perhaps someone you'd been talking to half an hour before, lay dead. As bullets cut into the sand, in a landing craft heading toward the beach, is 27-year-old Lockie Fulton, commander of D Company of the Winnipeg Rifles. Lockie Fulton returns to Juneau Beach more than 60 years later. I remember it, it got a little calmer as we got closer to shore. Down goes the door, and uh, out you go. You're struggling and as fast as you could go with one terrible desire to get to these dunes as quickly as you could. There were guys falling over and one thing or another being hit by the small arms fire. We had to go through it. There's no, no, no hold back. Fast as you could go. <laughs> and you can't go very fast if, you're, if your clothes are dripping seawater and a pack on your back. Along the beach from the Winnipeg Rifles, the men of the Queen's Own face a wall of deadly enemy fire. That first rush, racing across the beach under heavy machine gun fire, claimed a lot of us in the first minute or two. On a dead run, you just choose the path that looks best. We spotted a small gap in the wall. They placed a belt-fed machine gun there as part of the defense. Bill took aim, and it seemed to be the bullet that took the gunner out. We got to the wall and over it, and raced across the railway. The beach defenses were strictly along the beach. They were static. As soon as you were through, the, the, it was game over. And eventually, we made our way up to the high ground there at Grace and Mare. 
While I was waiting there for further instructions, um, uh, it seemed quieter than I had thought it would be. And, uh, you know, I, I, I began to wonder, is this thing a failure? In some sectors, the Canadians have taken heavy losses, but they have broken through the German coastal defenses and captured hundreds of prisoners. The invasion had gone better than expected, but it still cost a lot of men. On D-Day alone, Canada suffered 1,000 casualties, including 350 killed. This bunker was captured by the Queen's Zone on June 6, 1944, and we always talk about light casualties. But in taking the village and capturing positions like these, the Queen's Zone suffered 143 killed and wounded. It was about a quarter to nine, less than half an hour since we had hit the beach. Our small group holding our objective had no notion of what was going on with any of the others. Shortly afterward, I learned that half of our original company had been killed or wounded. Most of our casualties had been in the first wave in our men leading the advance. We had been really fortunate to get off the beach at all. Among the lucky ones, getting off the beach with the Queen's own rifles, are Tom and Albert Westlake, who both survive their first day of battle. By the end of the day, 156,000 Allied troops have landed, establishing a narrow bridgehead in Nazi-occupied France, and beginning their advance inland. As dusk falls, the Canadians are moving ever closer to the gathering Panzer divisions, now preparing a massive counterattack to drive the invaders into the sea. June 7th, D-Day plus one. With the beachhead seeming secure, reinforcements pour in and Canadian troops advance swiftly inland. The Allied plan, seize the city of Caen, break out into open country and swing towards Paris. Heading towards the airport of Carpiquet, the Canadians advance towards Bretville, Puteau, and OT. Now moving beyond OT is the North Nova Scotia Regiment, and with them is George Westlake. Dear Mary and Johnny, you see Vera quite often, do you? And she looks good too. Boy, would I ever like to see her. All I got to look at is her pictures but I can't take them and hold them in my arms like I would like to do if I had her here. Boy, I miss her. And do I ever love that girl of mine. Boy, oh boy, I can't wait to get back, George. These are two shell fragments from the fighting near Oti in 1944. On June 7th, the North Nova Scotia Highlanders and the Sherbert Fusiliers attacked along these fields over here, capturing the village of Buron and the village of Oti. What the Canadians didn't know was that they were being observed by a German divisional commander at the Arby Den just over here. In the afternoon, shelling started to increase, and the Germans launched a massive counterattack on the flanks of the North Novas. It was the North Nova's first fight and it was the first encounter the Canadians had with the 12th SS. As the Canadians advance beyond OT, looking down on them from the Abbey d'Ardenne 
is veteran SS commander, Kurt Mayer. A Canadian tank is pushing through the orchards. The commander opens the hatch and examines the terrain. Is he blind? Has he not realized our guns are aimed at him? Obviously not. Now it is clear. His tank has moved out to protect the flank. My God, what an opportunity. Canadian tanks are moving right across our front. The Canadian commander seems to see only the airfield. It is directly in front of him. He does not know that destruction awaits him. Advancing across the fields is Canadian tank commander, Sidney Radley Walters. The reconnaissance group was half a mile out front. We heard the reconnaissance signal. I can see movement in Carpeke, and we thought we'd take it that day. Then it all happened. The enemy tank at the head of the spearhead smokes, and I watch the crew bailing out. More tanks are torn to pieces with loud explosions. Canadian infantry try to reach Auti and continue the battle from there, but in vain. The 3rd Battalion's grenadiers are very determined. They want to enter Auti. Enemy metal monsters, panzers, lurching through orchards, shouldered through hedgerows, or lurched across fields of grain. And then we saw enemy infantry on their feet, moving with tanks in extended line. Everyone was shouting. Villages and haystacks were burning. Tanks were burning. And for a while, it was a bit like a shooting gallery. And then the Germans close in on the village of OT and C Company of the North Novas. This is the village square in OT. It's named Place of 37 Canadians in honor of the men that were killed here. There are a number of memorials to the Canadians in Normandy, and this one is particularly moving. It says, on June 7, 1944, in this town and in the surrounding fields, the North Nova Scotia Highlanders experienced their baptism of fire. 84 North Novas and seven citizens of Othi lost their lives this day. Amongst the 100 missing was George Westlake. Dear Mary and Johnny, how long do you think this damn war is going to last? so me, Al, and Tommy can get the hell home again. It can't last much longer, can it? Have you got a letter off Tommy and Albert? Well, I guess I'll close now. Lots of love to everybody, George. While the North Novas reel under the 12th SS attack at OT, the Regina Rifles are fighting to hold the village of Brettfield. With the Reginas is Rifleman Bill Burton. June 8, 8, we had one of the fiercest enemy attacks of the entire war. Two Panther tanks had penetrated right up to the front gates of our battalion headquarters. The first Panther fired machine guns and an 88 up the street at our headquarters. This is the village of Brettville, and one of the most exceptional actions of the Normandy campaign was the defense of Brettville by the Regina Rifles. On the evening of June 8th, the Germans attacked the Reginas, and there was fighting in and around the village for six hours. The fighting was so intermingled that a German panther actually came down this main road here. Three Reginas with a Piat put it out of action and left it a burning wreck.
Rifleman Gil Carney, Clarence Hewitt, and Joe Lapointe, they fired off one bomb and hit the tank broadside. A rifleman ran out with the Piat and fired a bomb at the tank at point-blank range, and it started to burn up. A second tank down the street, after seeing the lead tank burning, they backed up and retreated the way they had come. Liberating the village of Puteau, just a few kilometers from Brettville, is D Company of the Winnipeg Rifles, led by Lockie Fulton. I was leading a battalion, and I arrived in the center of the village there, of Puto. And the mayor of the village was there to welcome us. We had the usual thing. He presented the Calvados that he had kept, he said, the whole war for this particular occasion. And, uh, but uh, it was my first taste of Calvados, and I said, no, I've got to fight a war. I can't drink much of this. We consolidated a position right here. My company was right in this area. The next morning, about 9 o'clock, they attacked. Uh, we were uh, in a good position, and uh, with the help of our mortars and um, the artillery food that was with us, we, we essentially drove them off. First, I heard of the real catastrophe that we were in was a message from the battalion commander just for me to withdraw, in which I couldn't understand what that was all about because I'd had a good position and driven them off. And I never realized that they'd got us, had done the damage that they had. All across the Normandy front, the Germans counterattack, taking many prisoners including men from the Regina Rifles. And it was when they were being marched south, they were moved into a field, and, and a staff officer moved them into the field in order to guard, start shooting them. In the first two weeks after D-Day, the Germans capture hundreds of Canadians and the SS murder more than 150 Canadian prisoners of war. One of them is Major Fred Hodge. Fred um, was a long time member of the, of the 1st Battalion. He was taken prisoner and then, for, for whatever reason, um, were shot. And I believe um, uh, that uh, Fred was shot many times, and I believe his head was almost severed when he, when he was found. So, very tragic. Fred was the same age as I was, 25 years old. I do feel <laughs> terrible about So you're here for one day, picked up and shot and murdered. And that's hard to take still today. Yeah. Under repeated desperate German attacks, the Canadian line bends, but it does not break. The Allied bridgehead holds. But if the Allies are to liberate Europe, they must break out of the narrow bridgehead and confront the German army in the open fields and towns of Normandy. Weeks after D-Day, the German army gathers almost 2,000 tanks and more than a quarter of a million men to attack the invasion bridgehead. 
The Allied plan is for the British and Canadians to grind the German panzers down in the fight for the city of Caen, while well, the Americans prepare to break out of the bridgehead and head towards Paris. To keep the pressure up on Caen, the Canadians are ordered to attack a line of villages close to the city, including Le Menil Patrie. Heading towards Le Menil Patrie with the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada is Company Sergeant Major Charlie Martin. Riding a tank from village to village for transportation is one thing. That's the way we started the action. But the battle was different. Once the 88s opened up, we might as well have tried to ride a wild bull. The tanks sped up, turned abruptly, or worst of all, blew up. With weapons like the 88, the enemy had our tanks pretty well at their mercy. Firing from dug-in positions about 800 yards away, they had easy targets. Our tanks had to get out. The drivers couldn't see the ground directly ahead or under them. So a soldier on the ground had almost as much to fear from his own raging tanks. The battle raged for a very short while. Within 15 minutes, the enemy knocked out 19 tanks. In all, the Queen's Own lost 87, killed or wounded. This is the Canadian battlefield of June 11th, 1944. In the afternoon on June 11th, Sherman tanks from the 1st Hussars carrying men of the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada, of course they mounted all in their tanks, came across these fields. They got about halfway when the Germans opened up on them and the tanks started to brew and the infantry started to get killed. And almost out of desperation, a group of the Queen's Own, including Tom and Al Westlake, headed for Le Menil Patry over here. But the village was swarming with Germans and the Queen's Own never had a chance. Only after weeks of fighting is Le Menil Patrie liberated. And Garnet Watson of Toronto goes out into the fields to see what has become of his friends, Albert and Tom Westlake. I have been inquiring for the Westlake brothers for the last 11 days and haven't been able to find out anything until yesterday. Well, they were found together by another regiment and word sent to us. So he offered to take the Padre and go to get them. We found them all right, and it wasn't very nice to see. Tommy and Al were one and two on the same gun, and they got it together after doing a damned good show. I'd seen Al and Tom the day before, a couple of swell guys, and gave them smokes. They were unlucky, that's all. I will see where they are buried and get full directions of place, and try to contact the third brother and let him know. This is Benny Surmer Canadian War Cemetery. It contains the graves of 2,000 Canadians killed from D-Day to the capture of Caen. In the first six days of fighting, Canada suffered 3,000 casualties, killed, wounded, and missing. Missing always left some hope for the families at home. And it wasn't until the Canadians reclaimed the battlefields that the true story could be told. Near Othi, they found the body of Private George Westlake. He'd been killed there on June 7, 1944. The final shock for the Westlake family came when the battlefield of Luminel Patry was retaken. There they found the bodies of Al and Tom Westlake, George's brothers. This is the grave of Al Westlake, Queen's Own Rifles of Canada, killed in action 11th of June, 1944. His inscription reads, God's greatest gift, remembrance. Al and Tom died fighting together, and today they rest side by side here in Benny sur mer Three Toronto brothers killed in four days, 
What a horrible tragedy. For almost a month, the Canadians and the 12th SS struggle for control of the small villages around Caen. Then in early July, the Canadians finally attack the strategic airport of Carpiquet in the outskirts of Caen. Leading D Company of the Winnipeg Rifles is Lockie Fulton. It was um, uh, important to the Germans to hold Carpique and uh, uh, to keep, and also to hold Khan. It was part of their defensive position. You could see the hangars in the distance, although it was still fairly dark. Well, just as soon as we moved, um, return fire was coming. Uh, our guys were, <coughs> were, you know, falling like ten pins. But we kept going. So there was no cover of any kind. It was a straight case of keep going. The 15 or 16, 17 guys we had left and myself, we leaped into the hangars, which was uh, 10 feet deep. And uh, I think at that point, the heaviest artillery fire that I've ever experienced came from behind us. Trapped in the ruined airport, under artillery and machine gun fire, in two days fighting for Carpiquet, the Canadians suffer 377 missing, wounded, and dead. Oh, it's terrible. <clears throat> Worst day of my life as far as, in, as far as World War II went. I think it was um, probably a battle that didn't need to be fought. I don't think it accomplished very much. Uh, two weeks later, the, the whole front erupted. Car Carpegay fell and so did Kong. With the capture of Kong, the British and Canadians can now confront the German army in the open fields of Normandy. Almost two months after D-Day, the Battle of Normandy is still raging. But on July 25th, the Americans break out of the bridgehead. And two weeks later, the Canadians launch Operation Totalize. Objective, the town of Falaise. In Totalize, narrow columns of tanks with infantry riding and special carriers, or kangaroos, will race forward guided by searchlights and tracer bullets. The attack will be launched at night. In total eyes, the Canadians smash through two German defensive lines and advance more than 10 kilometers but inexperienced Canadian armored units go off course. This is the Worthington Force Memorial, 15 kilometers south of Caen. As part of Operation Totalize Phase 2, the British Columbia Regiment, which were tanks, and the Algonquin Infantry were supposed to come down the Falaise Road over here. And they sliced off 
through the road onto this hilltop right inside the German positions, which would have been great, but they weren't supposed to do that. They were in fact lost. The Germans couldn't have this armored group sitting in their midst and they attacked them from all sides to eliminate it. At the end of about 12 hours, the Canadians were finished. Uh, 85 men, including the CO of the British Columbia Regiment, Worthington, were killed, and about 100 were taken prisoners. A handful actually managed to make it back to the Canadian lines. The sad part about this mistake is it became so close to being a great victory. There's an interesting plaque over here, and it says, to the soldiers of the 28th Canadian Armoured Regiment, who on the 9th August 1944, in the surrounding area of Hill 140, gave their lives for freedom. Greater love hath no man. By August 15th, the Canadians are within five kilometers of Falaise. Meanwhile, the Americans have broken out of the bridgehead and swung east. Now the Germans are caught in a trap between the Americans and Canadians. Now the only escape route for a once powerful German army, 200,000 men and hundreds of tanks, is on a few cart tracks across the River Deves. This is a road up from the Moisey Ford. By mid-August 1944, the German line of retreat was narrowed to a few hundred yards and it was bottlenecked at the Deves River. There's only three ways to get across two bridges at St. Lambert and the fort here at Moisey. This bottleneck gave the Allied fighters incredible targets and it was a nightmare for the Germans and they christened it the Corridor of Death. This is Vimouche in eastern Normandy, and here's an incredible relic of the Normandy campaign. This is a German Tiger tank, and it was the most fearsome tank used in the battle. It was lucky for the Allies that the Germans didn't have very many of them. This one was abandoned in late August 1944, and it shows how desperate the Germans were to get out of Normandy that they leave behind a piece of equipment like this. The Tiger tank weighed 50 tons and had a crew of five, but the reason it was so formidable was up front. You can see the 88 here, which was deadly, could pierce the armor of any Allied tank, but the real secret was here. The front plate was four inch thick, so it could take a hit from virtually anything, at least head on. There's no way any normal Allied tank could get at them. The only way you could get at them here is by trying to blow a tread off or by hitting them on the side, and you can see the plate here is only two inches thick. The only real way to get them was from the air, and their biggest enemy was the rocket-firing typhoon. For the Germans, Normandy has become hell. Making his way through the inferno is a German officer, Hans Erich Braun. The never ending detonations, the dead, their faces screwed up still in agony. Soldiers lying in their own blood, arms and legs torn off, huddled everywhere in trenches and shelters. The officers and men who had lost their nerve, others driven crazy, crying shouting, swearing, laughing hysterically.
This is Lacam German War Cemetery in Normandy. It contains the graves of 21,000 Germans killed in 1944, and it illustrates the destruction of the German army in Normandy. What's amazing is how many of the graves belong to kids, 17, 18, 19 years old. This is the grave of Kurt Kiner, and he was killed 2nd of August, 1944, three weeks before his 18th birthday. Now enclosed in a shrinking pocket, 32 kilometers wide and 16 kilometers deep, more than 200,000 German troops are desperate to fight their way out. And the job of stopping them goes to the Canadians. Mid-August, 1944, the Canadians pursue the fleeing German army to the village of Saint-Lambert-sur-Dive. These are the slopes overlooking the village of Saint-Lambert-sur-Dives. On August 19, 1944, thousands of Germans were retreating eastwards through the village. A small Canadian battle group under the command of Major David Curry was given the job of taking the village. His group consisted of 15 tanks of the South Albertas and about 50 men of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. The men attacked down these slopes into the village against all odds. Looking down on the retreating German army is Major David Curry. As the sun rose, we found that we had a wonderful panoramic view of the Deves Valley. In the distance, we could see rising clouds of dust and found that we were witnessing the remnants of the German forces in France trying to escape the pocket. The column stretched as far as we could see. It was an awe-inspiring sight. We pushed off and the lead tank immediately came under fire. We were up against a Tiger tank and a Mark IV tank. My own command tank was able to knock out the Mark IV tank. The Tiger was put out of commission by the supporting infantry. We were then in possession of about two-thirds of the village. At about three o'clock, we heard a tank coming down the road. It passed so close to me that I could have reached out and touched it. We didn't know for sure if it was a German tank or one of our own. As it passed between us and a burning building, we could then see that it was a German tank. We put a shot into the mortar compartment, which set the tank on fire. We could see the end was in sight. Prisoners started rolling in in a never-ending stream. So ended St. Lambert. For his actions, David Curry is awarded the Victoria Cross. Nearby at Trun, also blocking the German escape, is Corporal Charles Kipp. At 10 o'clock in the morning, we received orders to advance on and capture the city of Trun. This was one of the final stages in closing the Falaise Gap. I led my section down a small hill from the north into the main part of the city. The Germans were headed my way and would cross at the end of the hedge. I had brought a Sten gun with me and I poked it through the hedge and waited. Three Germans went down and the rest put up their hands and surrendered. I stayed with a mortally wounded German. He had a few words of English. He got it across to me that he was 22 years old. He was a very good looking boy. He showed me pictures of his parents and his girlfriend. He gave me his parents' address and asked me to go and see them when we got to Germany. He knew he was dying. I would have given anything to save his life, but I was helpless. And to make matters worse, I was the one who had shot him. He held both of my hands in his and cried. Then pulling them both up tight under his chin, he coughed up blood all over my hands and died. I threw the things he had given me away, went back to my men, and washed the blood from my hands. This Sherman Firefly is a memorial to the 1st Polish Armored Division, and in particular their action here at Montarmel in August 1944. By the 19th of August, the German army was in full retreat, and their only way out of Normandy 
was along this valley and along these roads. The Canadians were attacking from the north, and on the 21st, they linked up with the Poles, and on August 22nd, the Falaise Gap was closed. The Battle of Normandy was over. At the end of the Battle of Normandy, 320,000 Germans are prisoners, wounded, or dead. Of the German armies that swept to victory, conquering Western Europe, little remains. The young Canadian volunteers, who had faced their baptism of fire, fighting to liberate France, are now hardened veterans of the battlefields of Normandy. This is the grave of Brigadier Eric Booth, DSO and Bar from Penetanguishing, Ontario. He was a brigadier with the 4th Canadian Armoured Division. And during an operation at the Laison River, his command tank was struck by an SP, or German self-propelled gun. The shell went directly into the tank. Booth was mortally wounded, and he died on the 14th of August, 1944. He was only 38 years old. His inscription reads, Loved in life and living yet in the heart of one who will never forget. Eric Booth was the highest ranking Canadian to die in Normandy, but he's only one of 5,000 Canadians who gave their lives. The Canadians came to Normandy as inexperienced troops and left as veterans. This experience was going to pay off in the battles to come.